good. I got them on what usually works. It's fine. It's fine. <clears throat> so what do you guys think? What are we talking about? Aeroflight with Broadhead specifically. Cool. How do you achieve that, Hayden? Go. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to just run through my whole bow setup process? Because I guess I... I'm just starting it off, Hayden. Ranch and I have a little bit want. different approaches. Like, they're, they're similar, but I think I I have a little bit more focus on the bow as mm-hmm. well. Um, so I guess just when I start with the, the bow setup, um, I can talk through, like, what all of the checkpoints that I want to achieve are with the bow. Absolutely. So when I get a new bow, uh, the first thing I'm going to do is put all the accessories on from the rest of the site to the stabilizer, I guess. The, the rest is the is the main one when you're doing the, the setup. So you get your rest just screwed into the holes. Um, the burners. Burger, that that's not not yet. So rest cool. rest screwed into the holes, just attached to the bow, and then get the the timing or the activation cable, whatever you call it, tied into the cable. And then the first thing I do is set up the center shot. Um, so trying to get the arrow to run through the burger holes of the bow, which is true center of the bow. So you want the arrow to run straight through those burger holes. Um, Hold that up and show what yeah. you're talking about exactly. So the two holes on these the holes right the here are the burger holes on a bow. So you want the arrow, the center of the shaft to go through the center of those burger holes. And that's the center of the riser of the bow. Um, and then specifically with the adapt, I don't know as much about other bows, but I think it's three sixteenths of an inch above um, like level for the arrow. So you want the arrow to be tilted down slightly, but not very much. And I... I do everything a little bit more just by eyeball. I'm sure a lot of bow techs maybe wouldn't be very pleased with that, but I find it's easier and like I get better success if I just eyeball things. So I'll just try to get it on just a slight little downhill and then the, the center of the shaft running through that burger hole. And then I also take uh, the left and right I set up by just putting the arrow um, on after I've tied my, my knock points and my um, D loop in and I'll just move the rest left and right until when I'm looking parallel down the bow, I get the shaft of the arrow aligned with the strings, and then there's another little hole in the middle of the riser down here, and I want the string to be going through the middle of that hole while also being straight in line with the shaft. So that's kind of like my starting point, so I'll start from there. Um, One of the redneck starting points that I usually do is, I'll grab the bow, don't so I hit the fan. Yeah. You got an arrow? Yeah. <laughs> So I, you and I are very similar in that. Okay. You look at the burger holes. You're, it's a it's a rough tune. Yep. You haven't shot the bow yet. Right. I'll actually put it like this, and I'll actually look down on the bow and look down on the yep. limbs. And once again, we don't have any tools. We're just trying to get it down the center. So for the camera's angle, it would be like that. Okay. That You're not going to be able to see it clean, but you're going to be able to see if, if you set the bow like this and look down the limbs, you're going to see that it's point off and then you break the rest loose and just eyeball it in because you do rest adjustments to take the left or right out so we're kind of getting it centered kind of yep. get, getting it a yeah, little bit yeah i start with the center as possible and then when i go back to do the fine tuning stuff then i go yeah. to the rest I but also, that's when you're shooting it yes yeah and i also one other thing that i make sure is in tune with the bow and this is specific to a yoke system um which is why i like single cams a lot because I guess it's just what I have experience with, so it's a lot easier for me to understand how to get your two cams like in time or the lean of your cam. So, um, and we were talking about this earlier today of, of like, um, I think your conception was at rest that you wanted this to be tracking down the, the center of your top idler wheel, um, but actually it's gonna be for a right-handed shooter offset to the left a little bit, because when you draw back, it actually shifts over to um, your uh, I guess what would it be draw arm not post arm but the one that your release is in it's going to shift over to that side so you want it to be offset to the left and then when you are at full draw that's when you want it to be down the center so um, to achieve that you just take twists in and out of, of the yolks on either side till it gets you got to put that in a press right yep you need a press to yep. do that so and, and if you're like me you just take it to a shop and they do that yep right. yeah exactly but knowing knowing that that is something that you can say hey you know this yeah. is what I'm thinking. What do you think? Also helps you have confidence to ask about that. The main thing you're trying to achieve 
to get good broadhead flight is you got to have it plumb yeah off the bow that's correct it's got to be that's why you paper tune and you do all those things and you can do that you know you can either take it to a shop and have the guy there make all those adjustments that hayden just mentioned or if you got a bow press of your own you're trying to tackle this on your own which you don't even have a bow press nope um, you do a lot of this same stuff and then tune your arrows. I just change the arrows, yeah. Yeah, there's a bunch of different ways that you can get here, you know, that you can get to the light at the end of the tunnel. Mm-hmm. But the biggest question that we always get is how the heck do you get the broadheads to fly? How do you get the broadheads to fly? Because a lot of people are going to fixed blades now or these big cut on contacts. And they're like, how the heck do you get them to fly like the field points? Mm-hmm. Well, the, <clears throat> one of the things that I've seen, and even in my own experience, before I started doing all the crazy heavy stuff, I shot 70 pounds, 28 inches, and either a 400 or a 340 spine arrow. Now, I was shooting aluminum inserts and pretty light broadheads, but having started to do all the research and stuff, the, those shafts really bend a lot at launch compared to a stiffer arrow. So they have more tendency to do this going down range as they're trying to settle. That doesn't mean you can't make it bend down the shot line. What it does introduce is you've got a lifting device on the back, and you've put a device that's pretty flat on the front, and it's bent. So the broadhead's pushing into the atmosphere, and it's pushing at a different rate than the fletchings are. And if that gets out of time, or it takes forever to settle, it's constantly going like this downrange. So you're overspined if you put too much weight in the front. Like if you have a heavy broadhead, or is that underspine? You're underspined, under. but I'm not under. even talking about putting heavy stuff on. I'm talking about shooting a 400 spine arrow because you're trying to shoot really fast. Oh, I see. And you just decide you're going to shoot the lightest shaft because you're trying to go fast. I got it. Mm-hmm. I mean, I totally understand that. Your, your goal is to go as fast as you can. But the, the shaft itself is really flexing a lot. And I so see. you got two devices that are pushing into the atmosphere, fletch and a broadhead, fixed blade, okay? And they're not pushing the same. Theoretically, you could fletch the front and it would be perfectly balanced. <laughs> I haven't done that yet. <laughs> but um, so what happens is they kind of get out of time. Try, it's a fight. Yeah. The broadhead says, I want to go here. And the fletch say, oh, no. But they over or under correct. So if you stiffen up a little bit mm-hmm. or at least test it. If they're not flying great, but they're close, just buy the next spine up and see. It's one arrow. Yeah. You can go to a shop. I don't care what brand it is. Just go from a, what, 400 340 to a, to a 300? 340, 340 and to just, a 300. If it doesn't work any better, that's fine. But it's one shaft. Yeah. And if it does, we saw your bow do this. We took you from a 300 to a 250 yesterday. You did the work on his bow just like you talked about. Yep. And all of a sudden, those things were just, I mean, and we shot broadheads the same all the time. thing with Jake's a couple of years ago. Yep. <clears throat> right. Yeah, and I guess to talk about, like, the bow side of the adjustments that we did to Zach yesterday, his his knock was coming out high on the bow. So, so basically, when the arrow would come off and we'd watch it on video. Yeah, we had it on slow-mo. Just on our phones, too. Yep, yeah, you can do this on your phones. You can set up a little phone tripod or have your friend behind you. Nowadays, iPhones shoot 120, 240 frames per second. Yep. Like, you can get really slow. And, and fletchings are big, yep. you know, comparatively. Yep. And you're going to see it. And we mm-hmm. can see yeah. it. <laughs> So the, so the off fletching high. and the knock would go up and the point would go down, making it a knock high. Yep. Right, know, and then the broadhead's too, pushing into the atmosphere like this too. Yeah. Right, yeah. if it was a field point, we could have cheated it a little bit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But because they're more aerodynamic, you can't. It's mm-hmm. got to come off pretty dang. It's got to come off pretty plump. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So to to fix that mm-hmm. issue that Zach was having of that knock high, we moved the rest up, which brought the arrow closer to more level. Because the reason it was going knock high is because it was starting on an angle like this. So when the force comes at the back of the arrow at the string, mm-hmm. it's pushing more up than than straight out. So we moved the rest up to kind of flatten that out, and like Troy said, switch to the two hundred fifty spine and got pretty good aero flight within 15 20 minutes Mm -hmm. um yeah going back to like the initial setup of the bow like after i do all those like just eyeball trying to get things as plumb as i can i'll take it and i'll just shoot a field point through paper um if it's if it's not 
achieving a, a bullet hole with a fuel point out of paper, then I'll either you can either do additional adjustments to the yoke, or you can do some of those rest adjustments to try to maybe find where that center shot is, because maybe your eyeball just wasn't great. So you can use make those rest adjustments. It's the similar concept you follow follow the knock when mm -hmm. making those rest adjustments. Mm -hmm. So you can you could do this by setting up a target at 20 yards, filming a bunch of this in slow motion with your phone, and just looking at the arrow flight. Yep. Uh, you can do this with a piece of paper if you're shooting field points right. Sure, you can shoot broadheads through paper. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. You can shoot broadheads right through paper too. Yeah. I would do that. I would, if you paper tune and you get a bullet hole with a field point, I would shoot your broadhead and just say, see what it does. And yep. if it's fine, you're probably good. Yeah, typically, yeah. like, it's usually can, what has been the case with me anyway. You can get that, if, even if you get that bullet hole with a field point, then you go out and you shoot that broadhead in the field and then have somebody recording behind you in slow motion so you can see what it's doing. Um, and I know some people do rest adjustments based on like where the arrow's hitting with a broadhead comparatively to the field point but i like to just look at the video and see what that fletching's doing in relation to the front of the arrow and then right. make those slight rest adjustments from there i got a question is it is it a good thing to paper tune at different distances no so, like, because you'll oh, get different results sure but everybody paper tunes right out of the bow mm -hmm. and that's when the arrow is coming off flexing right it's coming off the string it's coming off the string and it's starting to flex it 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 actually should be in its most unstable condition okay so at launch at launch and, and then, then it a will settle few feet down it starts to it starts to settle yeah i see so probably f th two or three yards right got you so that's I don't the know best how close place you have to, to two, two, three to five yards is yeah, typically right. what i do right yeah. mm -hmm. best so place you, to paper tune is right yeah. out of the boat because you if the launch is bad all of it goes to hell right if the launch is no good, you, you'll never get it back. It yes. doesn't. A lot of people think you can get an arrow shaft to stabilize downrange. Well, what happens is if it leaves the shot line, they do become more stable because they don't have the shove. So they start to f they flitter a little bit. The, bro the fletchings can overwhelm a little bit. However, if this is the shot line and it takes off and goes here and it takes off to the right of the shot line, it's never coming back. Yeah. So that's why you need your launch conditions to be pretty solid right out of the bow. Mm -hmm. And then theoretically a left hand tear will mean that the, bro the arrow should travel to the right. To the right, yeah. Because it's bent this way and it, there's no way to, um, Re I describe it like this. It when you're driving a car, it. not that anybody's ever drifted in a ditch, <laughs> but I have <laughs> both ditches. You're able to give it gas swing the ass of your car around, go all the way across the shot line, which is the road, go equal, go an equal amount of distance in the other ditch, punch it, and set to, to, and get back on the road. So let's say you're, so you drifted a perfect distance it's on both sides. because you've got propulsion in the but back. But you have gas. Yeah. yeah. You don't have that. Arrow slowing arrow. down. Yeah. Doesn't have any more jump. Mm -hmm. and that's so all if it leaves energy. the shot line... It doesn't have the ability to go... Arrow's getting sucked in the ditch. Let's say it crosses the shot line, <laughs> right? However far it goes out here, it's dumped that energy and will never go equally back. Mm -hmm. If you had a little jet on there and we could ch -ch -ch <laughs> get him to fly it like the drone, <laughs> you could actually do it. But it doesn't it doesn't work that way. Sure. Mm -hmm. So that's why you got to have a really good launch, five yards, you know, yep. and get it running. Yeah, and I guess if you're wondering, like... <clears throat> saying i don't have anything to do paper tuning i don't have a paper tuning rig i i built a paper tuning rig just out of pvc there's multiple videos on youtube you can look up like cheap paper tuning rig or just find some way to fashion a piece of paper that you can shoot through but um, i just took a piece of cardboard mm -hmm. yeah or like a cardboard box and then i taped the paper around yep a yeah lot so of there's a lot sure, of different cheap make ways. sure it's level though yeah yep if you put it on the ground you'll get false tail high yeah yep. right yep. generally speaking yeah you right. want your bow to be shooting you as, want it as level you. as possible yeah. but yeah there's yeah. tons of different cheap ways you can set up your own <laughs> i had a guy who put his he put his ladder up there i said it'll be fine oh no Boom! <laughs> arrow went in 400 pieces like that's too small to shoot through yeah. so hey do whatever you want you do you but that the ladder was safe. a bad decision yeah <laughs> 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 your goal though is that you can Shoot the same grain weight field point as you're planning on shooting with your broadheads and get those things flying as straight as you possibly can. And then after that, I mean, you could even bear shaft tune. You've got videos on your channel about bear shaft tuning. Mm -hmm. That's how I started down this path mm -hmm. was I bear shaft tuned my first group of arrows. Mm -hmm. 
and I moved the rest and things like that until I started getting bare shafts to hit plumb. And then I started messing with the knocks. Right. Knock tuning. Right. And I've knock tuned arrows bare shaft and I've knock tuned arrows with fletchings. Mm hmm. Yep. But it's gotten a lot easier in the last couple of years when we've got these fancier phones. Yep. that shoot in that high frame rate slow motion and now you can really see it right when they come off and you don't see it with the naked eye right very easily i mean if you can see it with the naked eye 30 or 40 yards yeah you're you in got trouble it on there you are in trouble yeah you got problems yeah do you want it to like fake you out and then one of the tough things about not videoing um i've seen this with high speed camera shooting with, with barnett and then doing it on my own with just my phone if you have bad arrow flight, but it is consistent, your brain says, it's fine. Right. I'm used to seeing that. Mm -hmm. I have people come here all the time who bring their bows and they shoot them and I go, oh. Like I see it. They don't see it because their brain's already trained to this left hand, but it hits the bullseye and they don't even know. Yeah. In my case yesterday, mm -hmm. I thought my arrow flight was good because the only thing that was happening was this. Yeah. It wasn't wobbling necessarily. Right. At yes, least we're really yesterday. High in the tail. It was right. just high, so it would come off and just look like toof. Right. So and that's I'm the like, imprinting of right. thousands of shots of seeing that kind mm -hmm. of wonky flight, and your brain says that's what's normal. Yep. It's really weird how you can trick yourself. Mm -hmm. and then you put the camera up and go, oh, wow. Mm -hmm. One of the craziest things that Barnett and I did. I shot a 300 spine. We had the high-speed camera on like 4,000 frames per second. I had paper at about 10 yards. I had a 300 spine arrow, and I put uh, had a 100 grain insert and a 300 grain point. It tore this long, okay, to the naked eye. Which way do you think it went in? Mm, you would think tipped down, right? Because right? it's super heavy. Mm -hmm. It flew nose up. <laughs> it flew nose up. Barnett looked at the thing goes, it's nose up. You know why? Because he's never shot a bow. <laughs> yeah. So his brain doesn't think, well, God is heavy up front. He just goes, it is what it is. I yeah. said, it's not nose up. There's no freaking way. And sure as hell, that thing was stable, didn't wiggle, and it flew nose up and tore that tall. And with your naked eye, you probably couldn't tell that that was happening. No, I would, have, I, would have I would adjust the rest. <laughs> yeah. um, I would have pulled the rest Wrong out. direction. Uh huh. Of yeah. course. I mean, that's what I would have seen, mm -hmm. right? It was crazy. <laughs> we put a, a little tiny fletching on the back of that thing, and it almost flew perfect. And that's one of the misnomers of a little bit of the fletching thing is fletching's pretty overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Even little ones. I mean, they were tiny. And that arrow flew pretty good. But that's bear shaft is if if that tall. If you bear shaft first, that, I mean, that's really the, oh, one of the best ways to do it. Because it, you bear shaft first with the field points. And then you knock tune each one of the shafts, bare shaft, yep. until you get them flying perfect. I tell people if you get them within a half an inch tear, you're human. So accept the fact that you yep. might fl fling a few. But if you have get if you get tears that long, but if you got three bullet holes and then one tears a quarter inch this way and a quarter inch that way, just keep moving. And when we're when we're knock tuning these things, we're just turning the knock like a quarter of an inch at a time. And sometimes that brings it in for whatever reason. They just start flying straight. Mm -hmm. give, and give then you mark the knocks on top with give, a sharpie. Everybody, a reminder what knock tuning is doing to the arrow when you shoot, and like how that so actually helps. So about ninety, <clears throat> about ninety percent of the arrows on the planet have a spine. I don't know if y'all have ever built a custom fishing rod. Negative. I've built two of them. There so what go. you do with the shaft is it's a giant tapered arrow. You take it in your hand, you bend it. You can do this with an arrow. You can bend the arrow and roll it in your hands, and it will go boom, and it'll hit the it'll hit the stiff side, and roll over real fast. Some some fishermen put it on the spine. Some people put it sideways. Blah blah blah. So with an arrow shaft, that's the stiffest position would be up. And a lot of people ram test them and stuff to do that. That doesn't mean it's the best launch condition. That just means that you've put them all stiff side up. Yeah. But your bow, a, a 60 pound bow and a 70 pound bow at 28 and a half inches are not the same pushing mechanism. And even amongst bow platforms, 70 pounds isn't the same. You got rockets with double, you know, wheels this big around that are super aggressive shooting 340. And, and then you, you have bows that shoot cams. 285 yeah. and they're mm -hmm. soft shooting like the Adapt, which I love because it just pulls back and sends them, right? They're not the same 70-pound bow. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people say, hey, I'm going to 
I'm going to roll them over. I'm going to stick them stiff side up. Perfect. Well, you have a matching set of arrows that are stiff side up. But is it the proper launch condition for the bow? If you took them and shot them through paper, they may tear left. So what you do is you turn the knock, and you're essentially turning that stiff side over here. And you see what happens. Mm -hmm. And I've had them actually tear left, then right, then up, all then over the place. Poof. And then all of a sudden, choop. I'm an idiot. I don't know what all this means. I just know. He said, if you shoot it, look at the slow motion, look at the arrow, look at your tear, all that. Whatever. Yeah. whatever, you, Whichever method you decide to use. He said, turn it a quarter of an inch, shoot it again. Turn it a quarter of an inch, shoot it again. And make sure that you're getting good, clean releases. Yeah, if you flinch Because if you start flinching and stuff, you're going to get weird results. So you got to be real patient. You need to go out, shoot five, six, 20 times, whatever. Take a break, go do something else, yeah. and then come back to it later. And it's just a process that you can do all, you know, in this time of the year, in the middle of the summer. You know, when you're getting this stuff fine-tuned, yep. you can just chip away at this on each arrow until you turn that knock a quarter of an inch, and then all of a sudden, boom. That sucker flew straight. Then you shoot it again. It's like, man, that thing flew straight or flew just with a slight tear in it. Mm -hmm. Well, then I take that Sharpie and I mark the top of the knock and the top of the shaft. So I know where that, that thing likes to be. Yeah. Yeah. I know where it likes to be. And then I fletch them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Once you do that. It's a long process and it's worth every If you time. do all that, the one year that I did that, I was shooting absolute darts. I mm -hmm. had like eight out of 12 arrows that were just freaking lasers. And since then, I've gotten lazy, and I don't bear shaft them. I just take the fletched arrows, and I paper tune it, and that still works. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. But like out here, I'm watching the slow motion, and I got a little tail high in my mm -hmm. arrows with my yep. broadheads. Mm -hmm. Not bad. Just a little tail high ain't mm -hmm. going to hurt you. Yep. But I'm going to fix that before we start deer hunting mm -hmm. like i'm gonna work on my rest and look at more slow motion video because i got what three months that's so that chip something. away at it until you get it really good because the better it flies like, those reps are actually more efficient than trying to fix your form oh yeah 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 there's a lot of people that talk about for and form is this takes care of it all is, this this takes care of both though because you're you're focusing on Getting you're not focusing form. on your aim point you're no, focusing you're not on your even, release. You're just trying to shoot. You're yeah. just trying to shoot, and you're trying to shoot crisp and clean. Right. So no flinching, just poop. I'm not saying that the form doesn't matter. It's good yeah. to be repeatable. It's good to have anger That's points. That's what I found with all this is I just wound up shooting more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just wound up shooting more and, like, not really focusing, focusing on, on aiming, your form. just focusing on like mm -hmm. a smooth release right every time because that's what gets the best performance out of the arrows and that's what lets you tune these things it's faster. been my experience that a hundred rep shooting bear shaft and getting that dozen set up right is way better than shooting half-assed arrows yeah a hundred times mm -hmm. man yeah. when you get them dialed though it just makes uh, everything else so much easier it's and their so, confidence is just so, so much great. higher and they're i think really fly good one disclaimer that i've feel like maybe we could have said at the beginning but i feel this way for myself personally is this can be overwhelming every time every time we start talking about no, this it's totally stuff there's like a million things and I, I mean i sometimes am prior to this day i felt pretty embarrassed about a lot of the things i'm like man i cannot figure out like sometimes you start saying things and especially rock man will start saying things and it's like I'm back in, you know, trigonometry class. I have no idea what's going on. Mm -hmm. It's just like, shoo, shoo, shoo. You should, you should hear the crap he tells me. Yeah. <laughs> I can't yeah, even I'm imagine. hide in the box over here. <laughs> he does the crap to it's, me all the time. Honestly, though, it's like, I'm kind of a, if it ain't broke, don't fix it guy. So I shoot the same stuff year after year once I figure out something that yeah. works. In the first year that I, I changed weights and changed spines... That was the year I did all that bear shaft tuning, and I really dove off the deep end, all the knock tuning, all that, did my own fletchings. But I learned a lot in that year. Mm -hmm. And then since then, I've shot the same spine and the same weight. I've shot some different bows. Mm -hmm. So it's been easy. Mm -hmm. Every yeah, year right. I just right. take in my bow, and they paper tune it at the shop, and they twist the yokes, and they adjust the rest, just like Hayden talked mm -hmm. about initially. Yeah, right, sure, of course. Dial until the bow. We're, right, until yeah. we're getting straight bullet holes through paper mm -hmm. then i screw the broadheads on to confirm and i'll knock tune my fletched arrows then mm -hmm. with a slow motion camera yep and i'll pick like the best four or five out of there yep and i'll match the broadheads to them yep um so if i get one broadhead that is flying real good with this particular arrow i may just resharpen that thing and put it on there and that thing doesn't go on the bow mm -hmm. until i'm hunting yep 
and I'll, I'll designate an arrow in a practice broadhead or two or three arrows yeah. in a practice broadheads. Yeah. But that's it. Like it's yeah. just a trip to the shop. Mm-hmm. You're shooting the same, but in your case, you just changed spines yesterday. Right. And I actually think that for me, it's just every year I learn a little bit more, which is a little different than your situation where you're like, you learned a bunch really fast. Right, right. And there's just little things that every time I do have these conversations while there's things that go over my head, I pick up every time something too. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. The the 250 spine that I switched to, it's just making more sense where I understood the difference, but I just also never had a 250 spine or I didn't have many of them. So it's like I shoot them and then all of a sudden I'm just like overwhelmed and you end up just getting it close to where it's pretty good and then you just go. Mm -hmm. And it's, and I think that, I guess if there's anybody else out there that is that way, like you are okay. Like you're not gonna just have arrows bouncing off stuff, but at the same time, trying to chip away and learn these little things and keep making these adjustments. And I feel right now, since I made that spine switch, way more confident than I have. Just because my arrow comes out and it's so perfect. Like we, well, we did pretty good adjustments on the bow. We had the rest all in parts. We had parts in your hand. Got it all set. We won't break the rest, but we were readjusting it. And, and thank God you were here because I didn't know about that internal screw thing you yeah. should take apart. Mm-hmm. Do this stuff early. I think that's the biggest thing because yeah. as of two days before, Hayden has my pieces that's of my rest one. falling in the grass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. he, I was shooting 80 yards with a whole different setup. And then all of a sudden here we are switching my whole entire setup. Hayden's got literally pieces of my rest in his mouth falling in the grass. <laughs> and, you know, if you're doing that and a month before season September, you're gonna be feeling nervous opener. you're That's gonna be the number one nervous. issue shops have yeah when i've talked to the best bow techs like our our guys up at archery field and sports mm-hmm. those guys are awesome mm-hmm. two weeks before deer season every time we go up there i'm like what's your all's work what what's your all's biggest challenge he says everybody waits and then they all come in here and these small archery shops they work hard to make a living mm-hmm. they're small time like they're mm-hmm. small business owners yep, yep. I get where they're coming from, and they struggle because they have to hire part-time help for one and a half Mm -hmm. months or something. It's like going early, going in May and June and July 4th and get all this crap taken care of now. They're not busy right now because that's their busy season. (laughs) Because everybody everybody else is waiting, so you better get in there first. Like you were talking about the L camp deal. Mm Mm-hmm. People wait to go. Uh, they they go. They're planning on going elk hunting, and they sit there and they shoot at a target with a field point on. It's yep. seventy five yards all summer. Yep. And then they go elk hunting and they don't shoot their broadheads. Yeah. Not, like you not gotta, good. <laughs> you got to shoot your broadheads. Yeah. We shoot our broadheads every every single time. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't shoot a field point. I think we were all. tuning with broadheads yesterday. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Yeah. That whole that whole switch was never never. We buy extra three packs broadheads. of broadheads just to pretty much shoot them at targets. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. But. Yeah. The other the other aspect of this I was just thinking just popped in my head is the broadhead itself because like I've tried to screw on some big wide gnarly looking suckers and they did not fly like yeah the wide things are crazy right now a lot of the companies are coming out with inch and a quarter wide fixed blades and stuff I, and I can't tell you what the better exact, blood trails and all this yeah, stuff I can't tell you what the exact measurement was but mm-hmm. once I, I had four or five different ones out there and they went from real narrow you know, like inch and whatever, eighth, all the way up to two inches mm-hmm. per pair. I mean, just, oh, yeah. I mean, huge. And uh, the wider it got, the more issues I was having. But I don't remember really where that started and where it ended at. I just know that, man, when I put those big wide suckers on there, they started playing in bad. Yeah. And I did not have good flight, even though my bow was tuned. So, you know that may that may be something that you try too is try shooting different heads yeah until you find one that your system and likes. again if you have more time the easier that becomes because i have also got myself in the situation where i'm doing other things and the summer gets ahead of me and then all of a sudden i'm just like wait i gotta figure this out and then you end up just not getting it as good as you want it to be in that if your flight isn't good even if you're hitting well so like we were just talking about this a two hours ago it's like if you're shooting your bow and all every once in a while even if it's you know every fourth arrow 
it starts doing that downrange, and even if it hits where you're aiming and your groups are still good, at least for me, that crushes my confidence. When those arrows are doing this out at, at the halfway point to the target, and it's doing this, I just lose my confidence. And right now, having shot already probably 50 arrows with this new setup, it's like, when it goes... They're super consistent. And, yeah. and I visibly saw, and I know this sounds ridiculous, how much easier it cut through that pig last night than even the one that it kind of bounced off the night before with the other setup. Mm -hmm. It's like, when we it saw it, We good, saw it destabilize on camera, though. Yep. On the way to the pig. Yep. And when, and when it hits that one that I shot last night, it just has perfect flight when it hits it's the like palm. he wasn't there yeah and it's i like think he wasn't there. it makes total sense well that was him picking up on your on the ass high thing yeah there's no doubt yep. that we leveled your rest when that thing got that arrow. pops off high or low or whatever in the back end swerves do the fletchings immediately start spinning faster no because they're encountering more air on the side no, or can't. that doesn't matter that doesn't matter they're just they're just wobbling and there's so they're they're ro if you think about the idea of jumping rope and running sideways that's what your arrows are doing, except the jump rope's rolling too. So there's the the other arrow. Yeah. So as the uh, like a really saw uh, underspined arrow is doing this and this at the same time. Yeah. You have a lifting device and a broadhead out front. You have the shaft bent, so it's in this shape a lot, and it's rolling around. Yeah. And the side of the broadhead's actually hitting the atmosphere then the fletching takes over and pushes it this way I got and you. it's a war that's right it's a war when you when, I, when you watch that video of my underspined arrow it's like wobbling downrange like this flexing mm -hmm. a lot mm -hmm. and then when Greg filmed with his really high frame camera me shoot the newer setup with a stiffer spine it comes off the bow and it looks like it's sitting on a table mm-hmm and that was pretty interesting to me. Yeah, that's too, a really good launch. That's a, that's a combination of him getting the bow yep. squared up. Totally. Is what I call it. In yep. the right position. In your case, it's mm -hmm. three sixteenths over. That's squared up. It's not perfectly plumb. It's squared up for the bow platform the way it's supposed to run it, right? Yeah. Yeah, and you think about like how hard the arrow's gonna hit and like we'll call like the the direction the arrow's gonna be going, we'll call that the X plane. If there's any energy going in the y plane or the or the z plane whatever mm -hmm. you want to call it that's taking away from energy on the x plane so the closer you can get it to being on just that plane that's right the more energy it's going to car carry through the target yes so that's probably why that's you, what i saw yesterday yes. yeah exactly yeah. And, it, and it doesn't hurt also um the higher uh, arrow with higher four to center is actually going to fly a little bit more like this it's okay that the knocks follow on the point and mm -hmm. going downhill downrange for all the people that shoot really light arrows really far like 80 yards it's the same thing your arrow is just because you're shooting a light arrow it doesn't mean your arrow is falling like this the shafts the fletchings are dragging on it it's going in at this angle mm -hmm. however far you get once you get way out there it really gets following the point but it's okay that the point is following the yeah it's just gravity but it could be dropping and still be tail high so when it hits yeah. We saw that yesterday Levers. on the shooting through the weeds Yeah, when those arrows would destabilize because they hit something hard and they would start wobbling, which you would expect, right? And then they would hit the target and you'd see it going like that because, at, to your point, if a knock's not following the point, and it's over here, th this is a long stick. There's yeah. a ton of leverage. Yeah. And, and you hit where you're aiming still. It hits yeah. a really hard yeah. thing. And that's, Call it ass. And that's what I feel <laughs> like I saw and I'm seeing it is kind of the light bulb moment where it's like, well, absolutely you're getting more penetration when the knock is following the point and everything's super smooth because when it is doing all these things in flight and then it hits the target, well, then it, from there, where's that point going to get go? That's you know, right. well, it, A, like you said, the energy's not as good and B, might have some weird angle going into it but if she's just going true it's just poof yeah and it's like butter and i know that that's true because i've seen it i've watched your arrows do it i've watched all my friends do it but and i've heard you talk about it for forever but to actually see it for yourself is kind of an awesome moment and that, where you're that's like, not that's ah. that's mass independent so if you're shooting a 400 spine arrow or a thousand grain arrow i don't care if it's a thousand grains if it hits like that 
you've got a thousand grains going sideways. Yes. It, it's probably going to penetrate a little more because it's heavy, but it's too anecdotal to say that much more. Yes. It's got to be fine. You're straight. pissing up a rope. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it needs to be that going perfectly straight. It is pissing up a rope is counterproductive. <laughs> but that is key, and that's why we have paper tap, you know, platoon, get the bow square. Get it flying tight, no mm -hmm. matter what your arrow mass yeah, is. Yeah, we get so many questions that just say from people, like, I cannot get my fixed blade broadheads to fly. I can't get my broadheads to fly. So if I fly. was, we talked about this on the porch yesterday. 90% of people are underspined. Yeah. Because they're, they've decided the arrow mass, and they've decided how fast they want to shoot over. Picking the thing that perfect flies. Perfect flight. Mm -hmm. Right. Choosing the thing that Right. Works best. And I know I, you can accuse me of being the heavy arrow guy and all that crap. That's fine. Light arrow, you can shoot a stiffer spine and still shoot 400 grains. You can just test it. Mm -hmm. I, I don't care. But if it's flying sideways, it, it can it's, be going 400 feet per second. It's flying freaking sideways. Yeah. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And I then mean, all of this gyration starts happening. Yeah. Yeah. I this, think is a, this is a YouTube short moment potentially <laughs> that i'm just thinking of here but because i know you filmed this with your phone we shot a we shot a dead pig yesterday through the shoulder with a mechanical on there with 600 grain arrow uh -huh. and that thing went in like an inch and a half mm -hmm. and then we shot it with the same arrow with a single bevel broadhead and it went and if the target wasn't behind it it would have been it would have went clean through all the way through the pig mm -hmm. like that's just mm -hmm. that was insane to think of and that arrow was an absolute dart going in there what, I, what my point is here is when the mechanical hit i'm not so sure that um i don't know if it was flying straight or not but when it hit you could see the back end of this in slow motion like just do this stuff i yeah. want to get it doesn't out. matter the, the the point i'm making is it doesn't matter how fast or what you're doing when that thing hit and the, the back end of the arrow was doing that, it's over. Yeah. I want to get the high-speed just... camera on some of them to the point that we can actually watch the deployment. Because I believe, it's just logic in my head, it's totally anecdotal. I don't know the answer to this. But in theory, if it's not perfectly flat and perfectly broadside, you are going to have inconsistent blade deployment. I can't understand how it couldn't occur. I, hey, that has been my biggest thing with mechanical broadheads for forever. They don't, it does not make sense I mean, quartering me. shots. Here's where I'm going with this. Quartering, <laughs> shots, are, quartering <laughs> shots are terrifying. Here's where yeah. I'm going with this all. Is that this is exactly what I'm thinking. This what you're saying here. I'm going to land the plane here. Just give me a second. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mechanicals fly like field points. They're supposed to fly like field points. You, if you're shooting a mechanical, you need to be doing the exact same things that Absolutely. we're talking yeah. about here. Yeah. You Absolutely. need to be looking at your flight in slow totally. motion. Because if, if your mechanical hits exactly where your field points hit, but you have weird arrow flight yeah. getting there, and you don't take the time to look at that, mm -hmm. the arrow's not going to hit plumb, and you're going to get weird, weird blade deployment. It's going to be even more magnified than the fixed blade stuff because one blade's going to open up. You already are losing energy with it levering like this, and then you in the front you have this weird blade deployment. Yep. And you're just, I mean, you're getting no penetration. Mm -hmm. You're getting robbed of all of that. Yeah. I know you all have had a couple that the arrow like exited sideways and. Yep. It was broadside shot and the arrow went out. No, yeah, we didn't do so. any tuning. We got well, back then. We just shot our fill points until like mm -hmm. everything looked good to the naked eye, and then we screwed them on and went hunting. Yeah, we never shot yeah. those broadheads yeah. because we just trashed them. You know, mm -hmm. if you shoot them in a target, right. like, most of those mechanicals are smoked. Yeah, mm -hmm. so we would do the best we could. I mean, if somebody mm -hmm. wanted to spine up and and decide on the arrow mass because they want to shoot a certain velocity, then you would find a lighter grain per inch arrow brand and just reduce the arrow mass and spine up there's a lot of options these days i personally want a five grain per inch arrow on a 400 grain point i could have a 500 grain arrow that's 34 percent four to center it would be a total hammer they don't make the we don't have the carbon for it just right? follows the point right and um so if if you could get that i've actually asked ed about this um the biggest, when he figured out forward to center, he ordered the, at the time, the lightest target arrows he could find. 
and he got he reduced his arrow mass from 900 800 grains down to 655 raised his four to center so this is all counterintuitive this is the guy who says you should shoot the heaviest stuff on the planet right but he was exploring the four to center thing and he killed the biggest asian buffalo that he'd ever killed with a longbow with 655 grains but his four to center was 32 percent and it was hanging on by the fletch on the opposite side of an animal that's that wide right and he said that was the most one of the most remarkable things so if you could get a lighter gpi arrow still stiffen up even with a light point, you're going to gain some four to center. It just, it's just math, right? But Here's an honest question, because I have no are idea. Are you sure it's honest? Honest. Totally oh. honest. I don't know why, after doing what I did yesterday, you wouldn't take your spine number down. So go from 300 to 250. Why would you not do that if, if you're shooting a bow setup like Hayden and I, Warb? Just depends Greg. on what your flight is. The Just simple because. answer is most people are basing their arrow choices on velocity. Yeah. It, which and they're is not going to achieve the velocity. Which is something I said to you yesterday is I don't care how fast it goes. All I want is the thing to fly better than what it is. Most folks in all, in all corners of the archery world, whether you agree on one side or the other, forget all that crap. Perfect arrow flight is... Is it what's the what's of the twelve factors? Is that number one or is that like number two or three? Structural integrity, then perfect arrow flight. Okay, I can't mean, it was break. One or two. It can't break, but it has to fly straight. <laughs> That's correct. I mean, I don't know how anybody would disagree with either one. Yeah, of those two. like right. it has to fly straight. Right. And everybody in the archer world agrees yep. that it's got to fly straight, regardless of what velocity you're seeking. So you so could velocity add velocity is like down the priority list. A yeah, long there's way. no velocity discussion yes. by Ed, but you could just gain. You could spine up and add thirty-five or forty grains across the whole platform, and your speed may go down seven feet per second. But if the thing is flying like a dart compared to pretty close to dart, and your broadheads don't fly to awesome, and I'll I'll give you a point. I tried for six weeks to make a three hundred spine arrow fly out of my bow. I got them to bear shaft with wheel points. I marked them. I fletched them. And the broadheads would just, they weren't crazy. They, I was videoing, they weren't doing this, but every once in a while, one of them would just, like there'd be two here, and one would just be two inches. It wasn't a foot. And then I grabbed a 250, and it was like I could just go, Poof, and they just behaved. Mm-hmm. So, if you're shooting a 400 spine arrow right now to go fast, that's fine. Maybe grab a 340. If you're having broadhead flight problems, go through the whole process you talked about. Just get that bow thing square, shoot it through paper, strap a broadhead on, put fletchings on. Broadheads without fletchings are real crazy. Don't do that. And see. But if I'm, I'm talking, if you get groups this big with broadheads and they go to that... It's a big deal. Uh, oh, yeah. I'll yeah. take the little... I'll take a little slower. Give me 10 feet per second off, but a group that big. Yeah. I think we'll go in that direction. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I've always been for that. I just didn't totally know how to achieve it. And I, it would slip my mind to just change spine. It might be that simple, especially if you've got existing three. And that's what my problem was. I had all these 300 spine arrows and I never even considered. So then I sit there and I dink around with moving stuff and I get myself way more strung out than I need to be. Mm-hmm stressed out well then i change the spine it's like immediately the best arrow flight i've had in three years <laughs> a, lot that, well, a lot of that gets solved by just doing stuff earlier in the summer totally, totally. there's a lot of shops that have a box too i did the same thing i got stressed out whenever i started doing the bear shaft tuning mm-hmm. i was like 30 shots in i'm like i'm starting to get tired yeah, you got to stop. You it, can't. Yeah, and I was pushing. I'm like, nope, I'm getting fire arrows done today. Damn it. Like, <laughs> yeah, I'm finishing this stuff. And it just got worse and worse because I'm tired. I'm just making terrible shots. Oh, yeah. It's like, no, just do what you just said. Just go to the house. Take a break. Go yes. fish. You know, go the first try again the next day. One yeah. of the first times it ever happened was I used to shoot in a traditional league. And in the 80s, the carbons were coming. And I think I might have been one of the first people to put a carbon on a longbow holy crap it was awesome <laughs> I remember just pulling back some arbitrary and going Foof, and it was like oh and it was really I was a much better archer because the arrows were flying great mm-hmm. like they were just more consistent 
and I got made fun of for shooting carbons, and now it's everybody does it. But that was one of the first aha moments from shooting. I was shooting wood, doing my best. It was super fun to kill stuff with wood, especially with flint points. That's really fun. A little off the track there, but <laughs> it was really great to just see fletchings. And my 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 woodies were there was always some. You just kind of you just kind of went well. It's a long bow. It's kind of crude, you know. And you're kind of shooting yeah. around the shelf. Yeah, it'll be fine, mm-hmm. right? And kind of, to your point, it's like I'm going hunting. Yeah, like that's close enough. Right. We'll just get closer. Mm-hmm. We'll shoot at ten yards. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. And that's another thing I've talked to Ed at length about is um, he preferred to shoot the buffaloes between twelve and twenty. He said when he was closer off a longbow, because longbows are actually shooting, they're pointing over here, and the arrow bends around, paradox, mm-hmm. around the bow, and he said it gave it time to stabilize. He said his 10-yard shots, he didn't get nearly as much penetration as, he said, literally 12 or 14. Mm-hmm. I was like, never thought of that. Mm-hmm. So even if you decide to shoot okay broadhead yeah, flight. That's, a, that's it, an interesting point, because at 8 yards, he would have been going faster. Right. He but at 15 going. yards, he'd have been going slower right. by then. But, but the arrow flight super stable. was better. Yep. Penetration was yep. better. Yep. yep. Yeah. Yep. It, yep. That's and probably it's, why it ranks so high on his list. Yep. It yep. is interesting. Just, you know, inference. I, I don't know how easy it is to find a bunch of examples of arrows flying bad and then the penetration result of that. But comparing really good arrow flight and seeing how good that penetrates it's really crazy how different it is it just definitely pushes in there and i i I feel like i have this vision in my head and i don't necessarily know if i know how to explain that other than if you just find different examples there are examples where you can tell an arrow is flying funky and it hits and even if the broadhead's really good you know and you're using a single bevel broadhead thinking of my of my situation where i'm not getting good arrow flight even if I'm using that single bevel broadhead, it's yeah. not doing the same You're thing kinda, as a yeah. slower arrow right. that just has perfect, true flight. You've upgraded a lot of things, and then you've downgraded because your arrows are bending kind of weird. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like it's not worth sacrificing for us. And 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 I do like to shoot far. I yeah. love practicing as far as I possibly can get that slider down to, baby. Mm-hmm. I like shooting that. It's just fun. So I do want to shoot far, but I want arrow flight above that. And because of that, I think that I'm going to be even more confident downrange because it's not going to be doing funky stuff downrange. It's just so much easier to hold a tight group if you got the good arrow flight. And I just, yep. I don't know. I, I, I want other people to have that same experience that I just had yesterday where you have that true satisfaction of one just sitting on the table as it's going down range. You our, know? our shop has a box of like discards and seconds and arrows they cut off too short or yeah. long or whatever. And you might be able to go rutting through one of those and get two or three different arrows that are the next spine up for super mm-hmm. cheap and go fling them around and just see what happens. Yeah. Right. I, it's, it's a cheap experiment if all of a sudden one is just like, wow. And if you start all this stuff early, too, you can talk to your friends about it. You can ask multiple archery shops and yeah, find absolutely. one that will support mm-hmm. you. Work together with friends. Like, I mean, if it wasn't for all these guys, and like I keep joking, Hayden's my, my personal bow tech now after he got me all set up. And mm-hmm. it's like, if you have that uh, support with it, too, you can all learn together. And that's what we've done. And I wouldn't be doing all this if it wasn't for you guys. So, to me that's really important to find people that are also interested in tinkering because even if you're not the most focused in the group which i'm that's not me Mm -hmm. (laughs) then you can just you know have your friends help you and have you learn these things slowly as well oh yeah absolutely yeah one one other exercise that i kind of just want to mention that i've done in the past and that I, i still do and Maybe in someone who's, it's their situation where they don't want to go buy a whole other dozen arrows or they've gone through this process and they're still having issues. Make sure you're shooting all of your arrows. I'll go through and I'll number each one of my arrows. And especially when I'm shooting my broadheads, (coughs) I'll take one broadhead. Oh, we got hot sauce. (laughs) Just breathe water. (coughs) We're good. (laughs) I'll take take one practice broadhead and I'll shoot it on all 12 of my arrows and just see if I can identify 
ones that fly good out of it. And it, it can be a kind of a band-aid fix if you can go through your dozen, maybe find five or six that fly straight, but just identify those five or six as your hunting arrows because they do fly straight. Cause I've seen that happens a lot. Yeah, I mean, That's think a lot with my no, no arrow here. is going to be completely consistent. There's tolerances within builds, and like there's going to be lemons and batches. So even if, like, th that may be even a first step, or you go through everything, and if you haven't tried that yet, just shoot all of your arrows and see if you can identify it through that process of just numbering your arrows and then seeing if you can get good flyers out of your that's batch of arrows. I've got by. I also have yep. a set that's in that box up there. They're my hunting arrows, like yep. for serious. When I went there, yep. guy hunting last year, they're still there. Yeah, I don't shoot them. Yeah, I right. bear shafted them, I fletched them, I knock tuned them, I put the broadheads on, I shot up the broadheads done. And you're like, oh, darts. These are going away. I've got five. Yep. I yeah. trust all the rest of them. I've got six more that are flesh with feathers, like I like, all my setup, and they shoot them too. But once I've got my broadhead set up, I don't go break, go bounce them off of rocks, mm -hmm. and I, I don't want like to tears. degrade the arrow. Mm -hmm. You Same, don't know what you're yeah. doing to it when you're shooting 3D, dicking around. Ooh, I'm supposed to say that? <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, I want the high. I want the shaft to be in the perfect condition. I want the inserts to not have any little wiggles. I don't want the knock a little bit cracked, the ass into the air a little cracked from shooting it a hundred times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah, no, no matter how well your bow's tuned, you're gonna have inconsistencies in arrows. So even like, I feel like that's something that everybody. Well, to your point, if you do. had one through five, is awesome. Yeah, I wouldn't shoot those damn things again ever. Yep. Save them for sure. Set and, them aside. And like Zach said, that's kind of how he's gotten by, and you can get by f through doing that process. I don't think it should be like the only thing you can do. But if like if that's what you have to work with, or y you've waited until a week before a hunting season, and that's your only option, and you don't have a press or the ability to tune it or take it in and uh, archery shops busy like at least do that that's mm -hmm. like i feel like that's a bare minimum thing that you should do and something that you should should do even if you do all the proper things after the fact to find those gamers that you're going to take to the field with mm -hmm. you and that also helps boost your confidence again which is just a, a really important thing in archery and that is how i've got the best flyers out of a dozen for the last three years is I just sit there and I'll have my dad film every last arrow and then I'll tweak them all to where I can get them all shooting all five of those best shooting perfect and that's how or perfect or as close to perfect as my whole mm -hmm. lineup is and then yeah save those arrows make those ones that are in the quiver at all times and have one you know extra that you shoot with your broad head while you're practicing and I think that that's definitely made me get by with less than ideal arrow flight but you know obviously keep learning then. since we're talking about arrow flight uh, broadhead arrow flight too if you're pl planning to shoot past 40 you need to shoot your broadheads out as far as you think you can shoot mm -hmm. like if you seriously think you can shoot 80 or 90 yards which i'm not a proponent of that but if that's what your deal is and that's fine there are people who can do it you need to shoot your broadheads a long way. Broadheads drag in the air more. It is, a, it is an aerodynamic fact. And if you set your tape to field points, I promise you, you're going to say, that broadhead don't fly out there at 80. Yeah, right. I got it. It's, it's big. It's, it's a heavy different. drag gizmo. It's way different. It's, it's different. shaped completely different, and it's punching through the atmosphere differently. You need to set that tape to broadheads. That's all I shoot. I, I haven't shot a field point out of my, right. out of my system. Till today, Til when today we were, when we're doing the hot ones challenge, yeah, right. I ain't shot a field point out of that thing in a couple years. So, because I've shot the same arrows, you know, same broadhead, same system. Since but I it's not it. because the broadheads aren't flying; it's because the broadheads are dragging. Yeah. They're not as aerodynamic. Yeah. You can blame the broadheads and yell at people and get on the message board and say the thing's a piece of crap. Ninety yards couldn't get it to hit with my field points. Yeah, I got well, that's it. That's usually what happens. Is it's a lot aerodynamics. Of folks, yeah. They go to a tournament or a bow mm -hmm. shoot or three D whatever, and they go out and they shoot a bunch of arrows with their field points, and they're like focused on that bow shoot, yeah. and they're focused on you know getting their bow shooting with those points. Mm -hmm. and then they put the broadheads on, and they're like, oh, this is weird. This is different. And then they go back and forth all the time. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know how often you shoot your 
broadheads. I shoot them all the time. I probably do 50% broadheads and 50% field points. Yeah. Pretty Like every session, I'll, I'll shoot broadheads as well. But I think, yeah, 50%, I'll still shoot field points just to practice form and yeah. and get reps out of it. Yeah. But I'll shoot broadheads consistently, especially around, I guess, in summer more, I'll be more likely to shoot field points. But leading up to hunting season, it, then I'll pretty much switch exclusively last to broadheads. Month, and then through all of hunting season, I never shoot field points. Yeah, and I, I zero everything to, like, my top three arrows yeah i want those things like i'll shoot those enough to get dead nuts with my pins yep and then i'll put those away mm -hmm. those are my hunting arrows with my super sharp strop broadheads yep. mm -hmm. and then i take you know my my b or c arrows right and that's what i practice with my right. practice broadheads with because you can get away with more with a real point of a little bit of funky arrow fly because they are aerodynamic mm -hmm. they're super forgiving compared to broadheads this, this is a great way to know the difference between your field point and your broadhead the broadheads are longer like every time you know, at <laughs> least 100 percent of the time yeah they, so you gotta expect it's gonna fly definitely. well if you got four blades you got four blades out there you've got bleeder blades just a little bit different single bevels or two but they've we got also their own talked earlier about the lighted knocks yeah I got, i've been twiddling around with this with one of mine mm -hmm. i I shoot my lighted knocks the whole time. Mm -hmm. If you're I gonna if you're I gonna hunt with lighted them. knocks, you better shoot them. There's a lot of brands out there where the knock is different, and it can make a huge difference. You are push. That's the only thing attaching your string to your arrow. And I'm not saying I have personally found the Luminox to be the most accurate knock. They use a boning stock knock to build their knocks. They put it in that knock, so it's a stock knock. And I'm not knocking the other brands, but I've seen it, and I'm. I will say this. Do not get the sleeve systems. Do not get those magical everything fits in every arrow. That thing is just a piece of plastic in there, and it's gonna, it will cost you eventually. Sometime, somewhere. Well, they just are, they weigh different. Yeah, they're different. Right. They're not. They, right. They don't seat the same. They might, they might even sit on your string a little bit different. That, that's been a huge you thing for me. You had loose issues with, yeah, with one I've had brand. Them just dance on there, and they, like, fall off. I mean, it's kind of a pain when you're trying to really get a bunch of reps in or shoot a bunch because I'll shoot, like, two or three of my arrows with my lot of knocks on, and i got to turn the things off every time, or I'll just leave them I'll on for the entire one. setting. Yeah, mm -hmm. or I wait until they're burned out, and then mm -hmm. I just use the burned out ones. Yep. But I've... I used to just buy three a year yeah. a couple of years ago, but now I'm buying like nine or 12 a year just mm -hmm. so I have extras. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as I get my arrows, I, even from the start, I take all the knocks out and I just put these in. Because I know those. I'm going to be deer hunting yeah. or elk hunting with these. Yeah. Yeah. So I just put these in right out of the gate. That's totally reasonable. You've, if, if you do all the process, you get your stuff flying, and then two days before deer season, you change the light of knocks, you, should, you have just made a huge, you have made a huge change. You, mm -hmm. It would be like just some random person walking up with some arrows and say, you'll be fine. Don't worry yeah. about all that summer stuff. Mm -hmm. These will be fine. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. It's a big deal. It's a That's bigger the thing deal than when I just think. had three of these. I would just have the same knock, and I looked in that box over there, my box that I was using a tune out of a couple years ago, and all my arrows don't have knocks in them. It's because at the time I had like three lighted knocks, and I would just I would mark the top of it, you know, and I, would, and I would know where it would correspond because I'd mark the shaft too. Mm -hmm. I'd shoot one arrow, and I'd have to go down there and I'd pull the lighted knock out, and I'd put it in the next arrow, and then shoot that arrow, like just one going back and forth until that one's done, and then go to arrow number three, same lighted knock. And that's well, that's, how you, get your that's steps a, that you you kind of walked across <laughs> something there that I, I want to clarify. If you knock tune and you mark the shafts, just put your lighted knocks in the same position. It's pretty straightforward. I get that message. I get that question a lot, but put the put the mark up. That's how I do it. You can put a mark down, whatever, but you can't see it if it's marked down. And just put the exact same position. That seems pretty straightforward. Yeah. But people wonder. So, but yeah, you need to shoot the whole system yeah. as good. is, exactly like you're going hunting, or you're gonna have some trouble with. Eventually, mm -hmm. it's just anything big, else. There are bigger changes than you think. Nothing that really comes to mind. I just would just stress one more time that just do these things early because yeah, if you're thinking about doing it, start it today because you wait till next week. I don't even know what day it is. It's late June in 2023. Yeah, you should be doing this now. Yeah, don't be cheap. This is the other thing because man, 
I was cheap at first and I would only buy like three broadheads at a time. And then I would want to keep them all sharp. This is like, which broad am I going to practice with? Mm. I don't have one. Mm -hmm. And you can't just buy one. Mm -hmm. You got to buy them in packs of three or whatever. And I'm like, I'm not spending those 65 95 or whatever dollars on them things. So I would just shoot my field points, or I'd shoot a bra an old broadhead in my case that looked like the one that mm -hmm. I was going to shoot. No, just spend the extra money and get three more. Yeah. Just buy just buy twice the amount what you usually buy. Yeah, and if you're practicing with broadheads, you're eventually going to ding one. You'll just set that aside. That's your ding, as long as it's straight, right? If it's got a big ding in it, just you can shoot it if it's straight. Right? Yeah. If you bend the tip, it's different. But yeah. I've got one out there in my case that Caleb hit the leg on the pig. We were talking about this earlier on one of the pictures. He just hit the pipe. Yeah. And the blade's totally re recoverable, but it got dinged. I was like, we can't find it. I got five more. Yeah. Mar I sharpened the whole thing black. Yeah. And that's my practice head. And I don't care if it hits a freaking rock now. Who cares? Mm -hmm. It's straight. Yeah. And that's, it's They're super nice important. to have. Yeah. Like once I just bit the bullet and, and spent the extra money on the extra broadheads, now I got them in my case. They're divided up. Mm -hmm. I don't have to worry about resharpening or anything. I got my sharp ones in there, and then I got my practice heads in there. They're yeah. the same broadhead, mm -hmm. so I don't have to second guess anything. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Anyway, All right. Yeah. Hopefully, you guys learned something. And if you have questions, call Hayden and Troy. <laughs> See you on the next one. <laughs>